Last time I did a review slash recommendation of The Nightland by William Hope Horson for my long-standing YouTube series called Books That Would Appeal to Gamers. It was also a Dark Souls challenge to win a bet. Now me and uh, Pedro, we were finally able to settle our differences over the 10 euros brought up in that video. So I'm not doing the same thing twice. Instead, I will be showing you the most downloaded total overhaul mode for Dark Souls 2, Seeker of Fire. Some epic moments from my recent playthrough and count down my top 10 boss fights while examining how the Shadow of the Torture influenced the Dark Souls series and video games in general. Book review. Before we can answer the question that's in the title of this video, we need to answer first, what is the Shadow of the Torture? A long time ago, way back in history. A long time ago. Actually, it wasn't all that long ago. The book was released in 1980 and was written by a famous American science fiction and fantasy writer Gene Wolfe. Born in 1931, he apparently battled polio as a kid. He shared correspondences with Tolkien, dropped out of the junior year and was drafted to fight in the Korean War. Unlike Hobb Holtzron, he wasn't eager to end the war all by himself, so he lived, and upon returning to the United States, he earned a degree from the University of Houston and became an industrial engineer. Yeah, industrial engineer. Writers write what they know, so there's a certain gravitas when you read stuff from a guy who saw war and maybe even dead first can and was a real life badass. Regardless of the genre, Gene Wolfe actually contributed to mankind by helping to create the machine that was used to make Pringles potato chips. I don't believe it. Let's see. Pringles newfangled potato chips. This makes it even funnier when you learn that he has published more than 25 novels and over 100 short stories. He has won the Nebula Award, Locus Award, and Final Fantasy Award at least once each. For those of you who don't know, and obviously I didn't know this either, but those are the awards that Nerds of America gives to the exemplary works of science fiction and fantasy. Sort of like VGA, but without the Dorito Pope and all the cringe. Thank you, Nick. Anyway, Gene Wolfe lived a long, prosperous life and continued writing even when he lost his wife in 2013 and his health started deteriorating. He died only 6 years later at the age of 87 and was able to finish his last book before he went on to continue his writing in the afterlife. Now that we got that out of the way, let's discuss the work he is best known for. The Book of the New Sun, which is a 4 volume science fantasy novel. It inaugurated a solar cycle that Wolf continued by setting other works in the same universe. The first volume and the one we will be focusing on today is called The Shadow of the Torture. We all know that saying, never judge a book by its cover. The most common sense interpretation of this analogy is that there might be more below the surface and you should never judge someone or something only based on the outward appearance. For example, taking a quick glance at this thumbnail would never tell you that it actually happens to be one of the greatest videos in the history of you. All of this prelude just to say that whoever came up with that analogy never saw the cover of La Sombra del Torturador. Take a look at this awesomeness! This guy, so mysterious, with a long cloak, a sword, wearing a mask, standing on something that looks like a balcony. The author of this cover is Don Knights, a well-known artist and illustrator whose work you have probably seen before if you read science fiction. He is great, but take a look at the British one. Absolutely awe-inspiring. This one was done by the British painter Bruce Pennington. As it turns out, he is also a well-known figure among science fiction and fantasy readers. I recommend googling his work if you are curious because it's truly interesting and unsurprisingly, I am not the only one who decided to read The Shadow of the Torture solely based on the captivating covers he designed. At least that's what the guy in this interview said. The bottom line, the artwork is great and it's what sold me on reading the book in the first place. However, I also have to mention the Japanese covers cause they were done by Takeshi Obata, the artist of Death Note. Small world, really. If you are willing and you love science fiction, fantasy or video games and have somehow never heard about this book, I recommend going in blindly. Seriously, let this vid run in the background and just read it, without checking the back cover or doing any research whatsoever. Why? Because the back cover actually spoils the main gimmick of the setting. If you have read it, you know what I'm talking about, but in case you haven't, don't worry, cause I won't spoil it. Revealing the mansion gimmick wouldn't ruin much, if anything at all, but figuring it out by yourself is immensely satisfying. You may think I'm being silly now, trying to obscure a well-known fact, even though it's right there on the dust jacket and within the first few paragraphs of the Wikipedia page. 
The thing is though, in 2024 it's really hard, if not impossible, to find something that hasn't been exploited, appropriated or in some way milked to absurdity. Finding an original concept, story or setting is a statistical improbability. It's like stumbling upon a very rare expensive nautical clock in your garage that's actually worth millions. How old are you? I meant it when I said it, you will never find another book, movie or video game that even remotely resembles the Nightland in context or the setting. On the other hand, TSOTT probably has some books trying to rip it off, but as for movies and video games, I'm almost certain it doesn't. Aside from being a wannabe YouTuber, how can I be so sure? Well, unironically, it's too complex. That kind of mystery can only work in a descriptive medium. Part of the fun lies in deciphering what the characters are observing or utilizing without actually seeing it. The prose was written in such a way that you can fully understand what you are reading but still feel unsure whether you are picturing the right thing in your mind. Events are often depicted with ambiguity. You learn about this world through the point of view of the main character, who for all you know might be lying. Again, if you're familiar with the series, you understand what I'm talking about. If not, then the, read the book. Of the you sub. That being said, it really feels like a video game setting. The story unfolds in the city of Nessus, which is the capital of the Commonwealth. Despite its advanced technology and remnants of a once great civilization, the world is in a state of decay and decline. Nessus is a sprawling and ancient city filled with towering structures, mysterious guilds and a complex social hierarchy. It's ruled by an autark and the power dynamics are intricate to say the least. The architecture and society are both rich and strange with elements that blend science fiction and fantasy. The setting feels marked by a sense of decay and decadence as remnants of past glory are mixed with the struggles of the present. There are peculiar technologies, strange creatures and a pervasive air of mystery that hangs over the world. The main protagonist is a young man called Severian, who is an apprentice in the Torturer's Guild. In the opening chapter, after nearly drowning, Seven and his guild bros are passing through the necropolis to get back to the citadel before encountering people robbing a grave. One of the robbers happens to be a famous revolutionary called Vodalus. And Severian, acting on instinct, saved this guy's life only to be rewarded a single coin. Thank you for saving my life, little boy. It's a daring risk you took. Have this coin and use it to get yourself some soft drinks of choice when they find out you help me and they gouge your eyes out. What follows next are chapters where Civilian provides some pretty decent and interesting world building. We learn about his guild, the hierarchy, the citadel and fundamental political concepts. The initial chapters unfold within the guild, with occasional venturing outside for glimpses into the broader world. What immediately stands out is Severian's role as a torturer. Currently an apprentice, working his way up to journeyman. Finishing side quests, carrying books to elders and helping around with prisoners. His unique uh, occupation makes the first few chapters quite compelling despite the minimal action. He befriends a crippled doggo, but more importantly, through his unique perspective, we can see the philosophy of this medieval-like society. We see how life and death are perceived in this world. In fact, I really like the characterization of the main protagonist. As someone who grew up surrounded by death and horror, listening to the moans of the tortured and killed, Severian exhibits at times almost an unsettling calmness, composed and cold, brave and capable, but fundamentally a child, a teen. His destined vocation is built into his character, as it should be. This becomes quite evident when the plot develops and we get into certain situations where a conventional protagonist might react predictably, but Severian, guided by his experience and instilled philosophy, has different non-emotional approaches. All of this makes perfect sense when you understand the specific way he was raised and educated. He's not a psychopath, none of them are. Torturers are not supposed to be people who enjoy torturing and taking lives. They are simple men for whom it is a craft, the only known way of living nailing nails under someone's nails. Pah! The protagonist is depicted as content and fulfilled, harboring no significant aspirations beyond meeting his master's expectations. So it's a nice juxtaposition when in the first chapter we see that there's something more in him, the unexpected depth if you will, when he saves Vodalus' life. Not even knowing why and later we get confirmation of this when Severian commits an unforgivable betrayal to his guild, bringing shame to his masters again, acting on his internal instincts rather than rational judgment. 
The betrayal leads to him being imprisoned by his guild bros. He awaits, completely resigned, singing What I've Done by Linkin Park, ready to accept death and torture for his transgression. Yet, Destiny or something else had different things in mind because unexpectedly, Master Pelmon decides to basically exile Severian from Nessus and send him to the distant city of Trax, a town apparently in grave need of an executioner and windows. He gives him a letter of recommendation to show to the Archon over there, but more importantly, he gives him a big, beautiful fucking sword called Terminus Est and dispatches him on his quest. I know what you're thinking, like, dude, why are you casting a light on the shadow of the torture? These are not really spoilers, the story is narrated by Severian in retrospect and he quite blatantly drops these events in the first two chapters. The biggest one being him apparently accidentally stumbling into a kingdom ship. Yes, the boy Torture reveals that he wins the Game of Thrones in the very first chapter of this novel. Such a great sword should have a name. What shall I call her? Stormbringer! From this point on, what follows is a breathtaking adventure with many, many, many video game-like moments. Just imagine the following. The protagonist, with a creepy cloak that is the symbol of his guild, with an epic sword on his back, traverses the streets of Nessus. Eliciting fear and panic among onlookers and filthy peasants. Torturers are a scary sight outside of the citadel. People usually see one only when they're about to die or be tortured. Again, this is video games as far uh, I mean, this is very video game-like. Trying to reach the outer walls, Svirian goes to inns and stores, interacts with NPCs, encounters other characters, takes minor quests, visits odd locations and witnesses weird stuff. The world building is great and above all organic. Svirian is basically a newborn and you learn about this world alongside him. This all culminates with one of the greatest examples of book endings I have ever seen. And remember, this is just the first book in the tetralogy. In fact, rereading it was incredibly entertaining because there's a fair amount of foreshadowing and even the title is foreshadowing in itself. And once you realize what it means, it's so f***ing cool. Actually, that's something that made Gene Wolfe famous. He employs a rich and poetic language that can be both challenging and rewarding for readers. The narrative is often layered with symbolism, allegory and subtle clues, making it a work that benefits from careful and attentive reading. He introduces archaic and obscure words, making the prose dense and requiring readers to engage actively with the text. As I did mention, the chronicle is recounted by Siberian, the principal figure, and his outlook that contributes an extra stratum of intricacy and ambivalence, for suit as he does contemplate upon events with a certain measure of subjectivity. The language itself becomes a tool for building the world and conveying its nuances, contributing to the overall sense of intrigue and discovery throughout the series, not to mention different interpretations of some events. At first it might seem difficult to read because of the language used, but sooner or later everything falls into place and you truly feel like you are a part of this world. This was released back in 1980 and back then authors didn't need to write like idiots in order to appeal to idiots, like I do. The reason I'm only diving into the first novel and not tackling all four in the series of the Book of the New Sun is because, well, it's all you need and revealing more would be a disservice. The first book wraps things up in a way that's oddly standalone despite being part of a bigger narrative. It's got a wholesome ending that makes it work as its own adventure, like completing a bunch of chain quests in a game, quests that follow the same storyline, and then deciding to turn off the game and maybe never come back to it. I'm not saying you should do this, but the point is, if you decide to do it for whatever reason, you won't feel like you gave up halfway through because, again, like I said, the ending is great. It's like stopping with Sopranos after season 1. You will never know what happens next, but reflecting back on it, you could always say, yeah, yeah that was a good TV show. The Nightland, although it doesn't have many touch points with Dark Souls, definitely gives off a similar vibe. Alone, adventure, limited rations, melee weapon matched up against unimaginable odds. On the other hand, when you are reading The Shadow of the Torture, it's impossible not to reflect and think of Elder Scrolls games, in particular the most memeable one. There's a sequence in this book where Severian with a companion enters a mysterious, let's say, glass house. That made me think of that famous quest in Oblivion where you step into a painting. Not because of the events, but because of how surreal that experience felt. Something happened within the world that you didn't know it's actually possible. But the book is not like that game either, Oblivion is light-hearted and comical, while the shadow of the torture has this atmosphere of constant foreboding and pervading ominous danger in the air. 
it touches upon human nature quite a bit, so of course it's dark. Despite that, it never feels gloomy or depressive, beating you over the head with melancholy. Some of the themes are identity, memory and the nature of reality, but you never feel like they get in the way of the story. In fact, it feels ambitious, yet in a manner where the author clearly knows what he's doing and where the story is supposed to go. Unlike Dune, everything feels so purposeful and planned with layers on top of layers, but the surface level story is entertaining on its own. While the series never got adapted into movies or video games, there was a comic book adaptation released in 1991 that got cancelled halfway through. It was illustrated by Ted Knife, uh, a guy who is mostly known for nothing in particular. The art style is kinda odd, but it grew on me. Artists aside, what's with these character designs? You saw that epic cover, you read this amazing book, and this is how you saw Severian in your mind? In books, he is a low-key badass. In this comic, he looks like an emo kid trying to take over the school with Necronomicon. <laughs> oh man, there's nothing more hysterical to me than watching this world burn. Among normies and younger people who are used to every franchise or series being milled to exhaustion, there exists an unfounded belief that a work's merit is measured by the multitude of adaptations it has spawned be it remakes, series, video games or movies. In this case, it's completely the opposite and as I said earlier, the Book of the New Sun can't really be translated into any visual medium. It goes without saying that the comic book spoils some visual stuff that you are supposed to infer on your own and in your own way, and the same would be true with the movie as well. The surface level story could work, but what's the point of adapting something if you strip away 70% of what makes it special? That never stopped Hollywood before, so this is the biggest testament to the complexity and awesomeness of the Book of the New Sun. Last, but certainly not least, is the religious undertone. Gene Wolfe was a Roman Catholic by choice and many of his works feel influenced by his beliefs. That is the case with T.S.O.T.T., but I don't want to discuss that now. Now finally, in what way has this work being all video game-like influenced video games? The novel isn't some obscure work from a century ago and has a pretty decent following, so it's kinda obvious. Well, this time we do actually have some examples, or references, acknowledgement that certain game devs at least read the Book of the New Sun. People on Playbit were able to find some stuff in Final Fantasy XIV like a character named Severian and some minor names. I have to agree that these are not coincidental, but they are basically just references. You can find Terminus Est Sword in the Symphony of the Night and Path of the Exile and that one is literally the one. From Software's games are pretty mysterious and people are trying really hard to connect the Dark Souls series to this book cause Miyazaki famously mentioned English fantasy literature as the inspiration but frankly I don't see it. Not directly or obviously. Not in themes or characters. The only fair tangible connection would be the environmental storytelling and setting but that's a stretch. It's just people wanting to see their favorite story adapted into a video game somehow. Or disingenuous asshole baiting views on 